So thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and Alex's talk was a good introduction to mine and perhaps the end of his was a substitute for mine. So he did a very short sort of um, intro to this question about collective approaches that um, his work is really interesting and I'll allude to it a little bit in my talk. So I wanna talk about a, an issue that I've been interested in for a very long time and it um, stems from thinking about environmental policy design as a way to try to obviously internalize external and if you look at the standard economics literature, it's really talks about, um, from an economic perspective, it talks about the use of different types of policy approaches. Um, penalties, rewards, and rights allocations are at least three of those. And so when we think about penalties or sticks, we think about taxes and fines and liability, um, voluntary approaches that have um, threats of regulation or the imposition of taxes. On the flip side, rewards, subsidies, payments for ecosystem services. Alex's talk was more was about the PES programs that he's been involved in. And certainly rights allocations, allocating rights to discharge or to harvest a particular amount of quota, typically tradable in the economic jargon for trying to uh, improve cost effectiveness. Um, and I think the key to this is that most of the literature in economics focuses on applying these policy instruments at what I would say is an individual level, meaning individual individual firms, taxing an individual firm, paying an individual landowner. Um, but it's important to recognize that all of these approaches can also be used at a more collective or group level. And just to be clear what we mean by a group in this context, um, it could be a group of landowners, it could be a group of farmers, it could be a group of fisher fishers, um, vessel owners. It could be a group of firms or an entire industry. It could be a cooperative that's been formed or even a community. So when I talk about groups, the idea is simply that it's a collection of individuals or, or firms of, of some sort. And so when I say that the um, policies could be applied collectively, rewards and penalties could, for example, be based on group performance rather than individual performance. And rights could be allocated to the group as opposed to um, an individual. And there are lots and lots of examples of these. The, the context that I first got interested in this um, topic was in the context of agricultural nonpoint pollution, um, where you have a situation where you may be able to observe, say, ambient water quality, and that's a measure of, in some sense, group performance for a group of farmers, and base a policy on that measure of group performance, an ambient tax, an ambient subsidy type of approach. But again, there are lots of other contexts where a very similar situation arises. So in fisheries, you could take your harvest caps and you could allocate them a, a total allowable catch to, to a group, a sector, as in the New England groundfish sector, or to a cooperative, as in the um, Chignik Salmon Cooperative that Chris has worked a lot on. Um, even for bycatch, you could have a bycatch limit that is not at the individual vessel level, but at the industry level, as in the Hawaii long line swordfish, um, sea turtle bycatch limits. Um, and certainly, uh, turfs are another um, example of a, of a sort of a group allocation mechanism spatially defined. Um, other examples that are maybe seem very different, but I, in my mind are very similar, um, in the context of hazardous waste, if you have multiple firms that have contributed to depositing waste in a particular, say, landfill, um, the joint and several liability provisions under CERCLA uh, are effectively a, a collective approach that hold the group of firms liable for the contamination from any leakage from that. Um, voluntary approaches, uh, whether they be based on carrots or sticks, can also have this dimension. Um, you could have industry-wide threats where a regulator threatens to impose a tax or a regulation on an industry if the industry doesn't um, self-regulate in a way that meets some kind of a pr group performance standard. Um, and then, of course, the collective payments for ecosystem services that Alex referred to is also um, something that can be applied at the group level as opposed to the individual level. And then, of course, there's the standard grazing cooperatives that we think about as common property problems. Um, Importantly, too, I think that just broadening the scope of this, this is an issue that's not just within the environmental area, but there are lots of examples outside of, of eco um, environmental economics as well. So we're all familiar as those of us who teach with sort of team projects, group projects in our classes, and giving a grade to the group as opposed to to individuals. Um, if you look in the Bible, uh, there are examples of group punishment in the Bible where a group of, of a class, a community, a clan, a country maybe is being um, punished for the um, behavior or for an outcome that's somehow based on group performance. Um, 
And even I would argue that when we think about something like healthcare, you could think about if you're going to have a limit on a uh, an allowable expense or some deductible limit that it could be applied at an individual level, but it could be applied at a family level, and that's a group incentive as well. And so the question is, how do we think about these kinds of collective approaches? Um, for our purposes in the environmental area, I think it's important to recognize that there are at least a couple of key features, and one is the nature of the externalities. So when we talk about collective approaches, we can have externalities that are within the group, but also externalities that spill over across the group, so what I call third-party externalities. And I'll come back to this distinction a little bit later, and I think it's important to keep in mind whether it is a situation where there is a within-group externality only, or if there's a third-party externality as well. And whenever you use a collective approach, it essentially means that there is some kind of an interdependence among the payoffs within the group. And that can reflect some physical interdependence, whether it's a congestion problem, a joint production problem. Maybe there's a relationship that's triggered by a market interaction because all uh, firms within that industry face a, a price that's dependent upon the actions of everyone. Or it can be policy-induced interdependence, and I'll, I'll say something more about that in a minute. Um, but my, the bottom line here is that I think once we have this interdependence, it raises a number of modeling and policy issues that don't arise when we're just thinking about a policy imposed on an individual firm, where you're just thinking about um, how you're trying to incentivize an individual firm. So there's a large literature and a growing literature on this that uh, has um, various dimensions. There are case studies that have been done. There's theoretical work that's been done. Alex referred to some of his work that's more um, experimental, lab or field experiments. Um, Quasi-experimental work, less on that, but some on that recently that's tried to look at whether or not some collective approaches have actually been effective in trying to um, improve environmental performance. Um, much of the literature is very context specific, and by that I mean that, for instance, the literature on agricultural nonpoint pollution is separate from the literature on hazardous waste management, is separate from the literature on fisheries, et cetera. Yet I would argue that there's a common thread here and that we would learn something by integrating these various um, context under a single kind of framework. So I'm not going to go through this in detail because these are things Alex alluded to and it's, I think are relatively well known. Um, what are the reasons that you might want to use a collective approach? Well, one clearly has to do with monitoring and observability. You only need to observe group performance. You don't need to observe individual performance. And it may be that you literally can't observe individual performance, so you really don't have a choice, or that it's simply hard to do that, costly to do that, and so you might find that there are some uh, cost advantages in terms of reduced transactions costs from observing at the group level rather than the individual level. And then there are other possible advantages that people have um, suggested. Um, some of the work that um, has been done on social norms and social pressure, pressure that um, Katrina has done, that is um, also a context where you might say when you put that kind of a collective incentive in place, then it creates an incentive for this internal kind of monitoring or, pre or um, uh, pressure, if you will. There may be opportunities to stabilize income, depending upon whether you're trying to share revenue, share costs, share profits. So if there's some stochasticity in the returns or in the costs, then it may be that you can reduce some of that variability by collectively um, pooling your, your revenue, your cost, your profits. Um, risk pooling is another opportunity. For instance, in the context of bycatch, there have been uh, interest in if you're worried about exceeding your limit, then maybe if you share your, the limit with a group, then you're less likely, perhaps, although actually it turns out that's not quite true, but you might think that you're less likely to exceed your limit if you pool your risks. Um, information sharing, economies of scale, um, are also important, and in the context of hazardous waste, actually a big problem has been what's called the judgment-proof problem, where if you're going to hold someone liable for contamination and you have one party that may not have the resources to be able to cover the expenses, then having a group approach might ensure that there are some, there's someone within the group that has the, the deep pockets that allow you to actually compensate. But of course, there are disadvantages, as um, Alex also mentioned. So free riding, the potential for free riding, of course, depends upon the um, way in which the incentive structure is um, set up. Um, whether you're sharing profits, you're sharing revenue, you're sharing costs, it's certainly possible to design these mechanisms to eliminate free riding. And I think that's an important point that comes out of the theoretical literature on collective approaches, that it is possible to design them in a way that addresses or um, eliminates uh, potentially the free riding incentive. 
incentive. But adverse selection, if you have voluntary participation, then you may have people opting in or opting out in a way that's um, counterproductive. Um, some coordination failures because you're not sure how other people in the group might behave. And then there, of course, is the fairness issue. And it's kind of the flip side of what Alex mentioned. Um, here, I think the concern might be punishing the innocent if I'm not the one who was uh, responsible for the bad behavior and yet I'm part of the group that is, that is punished. Um, so in my mind, what I've been interested in, as I said, are thinking about whether or not there is a unifying modeling framework that one can think about that cuts across these contexts that might be useful in terms of trying to identify the um, conditions under which these kinds of approaches might be effective or might not be effective. So, so the modeling question in my mind or of interest to me is whether there's a unifying model or framework that we can use across these contexts, and that of course is tied to the policy question about the implications of using a collective approach, when would you expect them to work, when not, and if both are possible, if you had the choice between the two, would you be better off allocating rights individually or collectively? So for, for example, in a fisheries context, you could allocate quota in the form of an ITQ individually to vessels, or you could do it, allocate a, cat, a TAC, total allowable catch, to a group of fishers. And then the question is, if you had the choice, which one would you, uh, should you choose? So, I don't know what the answer is to whether there's a common structure, but I'm trying to think about that question. And so my first cut at thinking about that question, and this is the only equation in my presentation, but it essentially tries to, I think, first highlight a couple of things. And one is that when we think about total expected social welfare, uh, in this context, it's a combination of two things. It's a combination of within the group welfare and outside of the group welfare. Um, and so this allows for the potential that you could have actions of individuals within the group, so I call those here, you know, XIXJ, that are affecting the welfare of individuals within the group. So in some sense, this is within group externalities. But then those same actions could have spillover effects outside of the group, and so you have the uh, outside the group impact as well. And of course, the social welfare depends upon the combination of the two. And in this context, I think it's also important to recognize the role of uncertainty, um, some kind of randomness, because that can also play an important role in terms of the incentive effects of different types of mechanisms that you might design. So it's important to include some kind of randomness in, say, the, the um, performance of individuals and how that combines to impact the overall performance of the group. So if we think about this structure, I think it will allow for uh, some joint production, whether as substitutes or complements, and the literature gives examples of both. both. Um, externalities, both within and outside of the group, and uncertainty, potentially correlated or uncorrelated. Um, and then the question is whether or not a collective approach can address uh, the within group externalities and whether or not it can effectively address the externalities outside of the group. So, this is a very simple framework that I've just put up. Behind it are, of course, a number of key modeling questions that one would have to um, answer or at least make some assumptions about if you were to elaborate and have a formal structure for this. And I won't go through this list in detail, but you, know, you can imagine what it might be. You know, what are the expectations about how other people are behaving? How big is the group? How heterogeneous is the group? Is the group operating in a cooperative or a non-cooperative way? What's the role of social norms? Um, what's the nature of the externality? Is it entirely within group? Are there spillovers outside of the group? What's the nature of the market structure that the, that the um, firms or the individuals operate within? What are the observability or monitoring issues? Um, is it possible to detect uh, behavior of individuals and to, for the group to sanction those individuals who are in some sense misbehaving? Um, is there a problem with budget balancing where you need to worry about sort of over-collecting or under-collecting and you need to worry about long-run entry-exit incentives of individuals? What role does uncertainty or stochasticity play? Um, is there the potential for collusion? Collusion can be counterproductive. It can sometimes, cooperation can be productive, but collusion can actually be counterproductive in some cases. And another interesting um, thing that occurs here in this context that is not really an issue in the context of individual policies uh, targeted at individual firms is the potential for multiple equilibria when you have, um, depending upon the nature of the instrument that you're using to try to uh, correct the incentives. So even though this structure is, is relatively um, simple, I think that for my purposes, it's important to think about the 
Collective approach is having two fundamental stages. One is the formation of the group, and the other is once the group is formed, what does it do? And at the first stage, at the formation stage, I think that formation can be endogenous or it can be exogenous. So you can have a group that in some sense forms in and of itself, by itself, or you can have a, a policy that essentially dictates what the group is going to be. And so this gives rise to what I would call two different types of collective approaches, a bottom-up and a top-down um, approach. And so a bottom-up approach, when we think about collect collectives, cooperatives, clubs, certification, those kinds of things, the joining the group is voluntary, the group size is endogenously determined, the motivation might be to try to address some of these intra-group externalities or to self-regulate, to avoid external pressures, to try to smooth profits, um, returns, et cetera, improve market outcomes. So the group itself might have an incentive to try to do something self-regulate on its own. And what it would presumably do is design um, its structure so that the benefits of being part of the group, part of the club, are excludable. You don't get them if you're not in it. Um, and then you can endogenously determine the rules um, of, of operation. Um, that's quite different from a top-down approach where the government essentially says, here's the group, and um, this group is going to be subject, say, to a collective penalty or reward or a collective allocation of rights. Um, so I think most people in this audience are probably quite familiar with the um, Ostrom design principles, which really relate to the bottom-up collective approach. What are the conditions under which that kind of co collective management um, is likely to be effective? Um, and this is just a quote from one of her papers. You know, when the users of a resource design their own rules, so this is Alex's point about um, having some control um, that are enforced by local users or accountable to them, using graduated sanctions that define who has rights to withdraw from the resource, and that effectively assign costs proportionately to benefits, collective action and monitoring problems are solved in a reinforcing manner. So this is, they will do it on their own, essentially, if the conditions are right. And let's hear some of the conditions that promote that. Um, but the problem is, is that that only works for intra-group externalities, and it doesn't work for externalities that spill across. So the bottom-up approach is really not, I think, the entire story about collective approaches. Top-down approaches basically are needed when there's this spillover externality, this effect outside of the group. But nonetheless, once the group is formed, essentially the incentives and the ability of that group to work in a coordinated way is very similar to what would be the case for a group that is endogenously formed. And so I think the same kinds of design principles that um, Ostrom talks about in her work are applicable once the group is formed, essentially. So it's very different at the stage of group formation, but once the group is formed, a lot of the same principles apply in terms of whether or not it's going to be an effective policy. And so this list here is very similar to the list in, that comes out of the design principles. Um, and importantly, though, here, policy design can affect some of these factors. And so that's where the question of how do you design your policy in a way to um, try to make the collective approach most effective comes into play. And so I think I'm getting short on time, so let me just summarize here. So I think my main points would be the following. That first of all, there are many examples of collective approaches, both bottom up and top down, and that these cut across a wide variety of contexts. And I think that they have, as I said, been studied more individually than was perhaps um, the most effective way to think about these approaches, approaches. I think it's important to think about them as a general class of problems or situations that maybe would benefit from having one kind of context um, um, looked at in the same kind of way that another context might be and that we can learn across these contexts. Um, research on optimal policy design for collective approaches needs to consider a much broader set of issues than the literature on optimal design of firm level instruments. So the simple kind of Pigouvian tax model that we're all used to as environmental economists is a very simple way to think about controlling environmental externalities. The modeling assumptions are relatively straightforward. Here it's a much richer set of questions, a much richer set of modeling um, assumptions that need to be made. Um, what does the work tell us? It tells us essentially that for collective approaches to work, there needs to be some strong gain from cooperation, obviously, some incentive to cooperate, and that that can be um, driven internally, leading to a bottom-up approach, if there is some reason for the group to want to solve its problem um, endogenously, um, but 
It could also be created by uh, the result of a policy that essentially has, gives a top-down approach by creating a group and assigning a group reward or penalty or a set of rights to that collective. So having gains from cooperation is necessary but not sufficient for the success of a collective approach. And so the theoretical and the experimental and the empirical literature all show essentially mixed results. And of course, that's because there are a lot of factors that play into this other than simply there being upfront some incentive for cooperation. But you know, if properly designed, collective approaches can be effective in limiting free riding and meeting collective targets. So I think there is um, a great potential for the use of these kinds of approaches, obviously not without limitations, but there is potential there, but part of it is how do we design them so that we increase the likelihood of success. And so some of the factors that have been identified are things that we need to um, think about and consider, um, whether it's the size of the group, the whether the behavior within the group will be cooperative or non. Multiple equilibria is a big issue, I think, in this context, and particularly when there's a need for coordination. Um, the potential for communication, um, whether there are direct payments or um, penalties, and of course, the ability to address the free rider problem through some kind of, observ uh, within the group at least, observing um, behavior that is non-compliant and having some means for sanctioning that. So, thank you. Thank you.